I think we're live now. Bajo Nikon. Welcome, friends. Welcome to our second Bright Path Strong talking circle with our partner, Portugal the Man Foundation. I'm Dendra Darling, a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation and a proud Cherokee descendant. I'm also <coughs> a co founder of the Bright Path Strong organization and executive producer of the forthcoming movie about Jim Thorpe, Bright Path. It is a pleasure to serve as your host today, virtually from my home on the original homelands of the Anacustans, also known as the Natakatak, or in more recent times by the Piscataway and Pamunkey tribes. And right here along the Potomac River, in other words, <laughs> outside of DC. To begin, I'm sharing a discussion I had recently with Joe Fontaine, who lives in Whitefish Bay, Ontario, and is Sturgeon clan of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe Nation and a traditional jingle dress dancer. I thank Joe and many of our dancers, singers, and drummers for their continued support dancing for us in this very difficult time our world is in with the COVID virus. Bless all of you dancers as you follow our teachings, the teachings to dance to heal, to dance to uplift us, to dance to pray, and to dance for those that cannot. Your strength and your commitment is greatly appreciated in helping so many of us remain strong during this time. I have a really big shout out for social media powwow. Thank you for lifting us up every day with songs and dance. Thank you so much. One day, Joe said she felt the need to dance near and with our nibi. That is the Ojibwe word for water. Her water teachings come from many beautiful women throughout Ojibwe country who teach us that Nibi is our way of life, our life giver. She is our mother earth's bloodlines flowing through us and through the earth. Mother earth has a beautiful life within her. She feels, she hears, she sings. We as women have a strong connection to her as we ourselves are life givers. We come to the earth in water in the womb. Nebi carried us till we were ready to be without her embrace. We need to always honor her, pray to her and for her and to help sustain herself for our future generations to come. We talked about the dramatic changes Mother Earth is going through and that we need to be aware of that and fight for her to continue to give us all the beautiful gifts she does. Joe mentioned a prophecy told in the Medevan Lodge what one day water, Nebi, will cost us more than gold. And those days are coming on us. That is why Joe and Ishnabekwash and tribal nations try their best to carry out that message to others, to fight for her Nibi, and to remind others to do the same by showing our own ways of prayer and honoring Mother Earth. I'm so glad that Joe is joining us by video to share the day she had the overwhelming of feeling to dance above the water and to dance with Nibby. We are grateful to Joe for sharing with us, all of us, one of the ways she honors and prays to Mother Earth. Joe asked me to thank all of you and the best, and for the best of you in all the times that we're going through today. And if you could with her during this video, say a prayer for Nibby. If we could roll the video now. Thank you, Joe.
Well, miigwetch, Joe. So beautiful, calming, prayerful, and honoring. Thanks for your prayers and dancing for all the right reasons, especially during this difficult time. I look forward to dancing with you when I'm up your way in Ontario. And until then, let's continue to dance virtually. Thank you and everybody that is out there dancing for us. It's really good to be here today. I'm going to... Um, start our introductions. You can see all these beautiful people on the, your screen virtually here in Zoom. And I'll start with uh, Oren Lyons. Oren is the faith keeper of the Turtle Clan and serves as a member chief of the Onondaga Council of Chiefs and the Grand Council of the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee peoples. Oren is a leading voice at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Human Rights for Indigenous Peoples, and he serves as the executive, on the Executive Committee of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders for Human Survival. Oren, we are honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I know you are the busiest 90-year young person ever. We really <laughs> appreciate that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Our other distinguished guest is Paulette Blanchard. Paulette is a citizen of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe and a descendant of the Kickapoo Nation in Oklahoma. She is a Haskell Indian Nations University graduate and uh, a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas as an indigenous geographer, focusing her work in climate and indigenous science. Paulette considers herself an academic activist for all relations as she and others challenge Eurocentric, white stream science and science education. Darn, I missed all those STEM classes. <laughs> I'm glad you're there. Paulette, we are so proud of you and your work. As I know, Dr. Wildcat and Haskell hello. University are out there cheering on. So hello, everybody. Tell them hello, Paulette. <laughs> Onward, <so> Haskell. <laughs> A little bit of background, we're gathered today because of an amazing man, relative friend, Native American hero, the world hero, and acclaimed the world's greatest athlete. First NFL president, businessman, entrepreneur, American Indian leader, activist, and founder of the LA Indian Center. During the Great Depression, an environmentalist, Jim Thorpe. Our movie, Bright Path, which is about Jim Thorpe, is currently in development. And because of COVID, we had to change up our schedule and we will not be filming until it is absolutely safe to do so. In the meantime, we at Bright Path have been busy. We founded the Bright Path Strong Movement to secure the restoration of Jim Thorpe's original Olympic winning records. Thank you for all your support and signing the petition. Please, please encourage your family friends, coworkers, and everyone you know 
to also visit our website, brightpathstrong.com to sign the petition. We hope to reach our goal by December 31st of 100,000 signatures to send to the International Olympic Committee to right this wrong and restore Jim's winning records. Bright Path Strong is now a nonprofit set up to amplify and support native voices and issues. Currently, we're working hard to bring clean drinking water to Indian country. And I just have to share this, it's the season, okay? My favorite on this site is our store. <laughs> I'm buying all of my holiday gifts there and enjoying drinking my beverages out of these great mugs. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> A good plug there. Now to our partners from Portugal to Man, Zach and John, I am so happy you're here to start the conversation rolling about bringing any news from their foundation who is doing tremendous work along with the band personally honoring homelands of indigenous peoples around the world and their strong environment care and protective respective messaging through their music and foundation. Zach, will you please bring us up to date and start the conversation rolling on what is Mother Earth telling us now? Well, yeah, actually, I don't know. And that's why we're here to talk about this. Uh, thank you so much for having us, uh, Nedrick. So good to see you again. Very nice to meet uh, to meet all of you. And um, yeah, I get I get to ask some questions. And uh, yeah, thanks for letting us listen and learn. Um, I'll, I'll jump into it. Um, so Native stories, traditions, and wisdom um, tells us that Mother Earth is alive with a memory and a consciousness. Um, and we were wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about this. Who wants to respond with Oren or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, please Pardon let Oren, yeah, repeat the question for Oren. I want to hear yeah, him yeah, speak. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, um, so native stories and wisdom tells us that uh, that Mother Earth is alive and with a memory and a conscience. And uh, was just wondering if you could elaborate on that and uh, tell us a little bit uh, something about that background. All right. Um, I come from uh, Arnadaga, and uh, I would say. Over all of this times that we'll be talking about the Jim Thorpe and so forth, that Onondaga is the center, is the center of uh, the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee is a uh, Six Nation Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, the, we have so many names, uh, uh, people get confused. The uh, French call us Iroquois, the English call us Six Nations, and then the Six Nations themselves, which is Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. Those are the Six Nations. Our, our Confederacy is very old. We really don't have a, a specific date, but at least 15, 1600 years old and uh, <clears throat> could be older. But I think the important thing about, about that is, uh, about us, is that we've been fortunate uh, on our leadership has been able to keep us uh, and our, our, uh, our Confederacy intact over all of these years and all of these problems and all of the things that happened in the world we're still intact. I mean, there's no question we're battered and, and we've been hammered and we've been assaulted, but uh, we're here, we're still here, we're still meeting. And, um, and we're then probably at, uh, the last, I would believe, I, maybe, maybe I'm not correct because I don't know everything. But I think we are the last traditional government in North America still in charge of land and still in charge of our nation. 
In other words, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has no leverage with us at Onondaga and um, Tuscarora, um, Cayuga. Cayuga is in a, in a huge battle right now between uh, uh, traditional people and uh, federal forces trying to overturn and remove them from our Confederacy. That's going on right now, terrible ba battle. And um, and the Seneca, the Seneca, uh, huge, huge part of our, our Confederacy and long, long history. And um, <clears throat> the traditional Senecas are at Tonawanda. They have the Chiefs Council and uh, they are a center for uh, a lot of our traditional ceremony. And of course the Mohawk are huge. Uh, they, I think they have uh, the most uh, people and they have many uh, villages, but they send, there's only one chief's council, but they have also an elective system and uh, they're bisected by the Canadian border, it goes right through the middle of their territory. And so in order to get to the Canadian side of the territory, they have to go through customs and immigration, if you can imagine. And uh, it's a, you know, it is what it is today. And, and I believe that uh, underneath everything uh, uh, on why Indian nations have been vilified and pesky redskins and we're the other, we are not, we're the outsiders. We've been outsiders for, from the beginning. And it's simple, if you're gonna take land from somebody and this land was all indigenous, this land was owned by all our native people at one time. And if you're gonna come as an invader and take land, then you can't take land from a good guy. So they vilified us. Yeah. So we're the pesky redskins. We're the other, we're the outsider. And that's where Jim Thorpe was. He was uh, in that middle ground, battling his way out through a very, um, transition to Terry time for native people, 1900. I mean, 10 years earlier, that was a huge massacre at Wounded Knee. I mean, they just slaughtered our people, soldiers with guns. Something like 23 congressional medals of honor have been issued for that battle. I don't know whether you know that or not. 23 congressional medal, the highest award that you can give to a soldier for a massacre, for a slaughter. You know what that is? That's guilt. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. That's guilt. Probably, yeah. Trying to rectify a massacre by awarding highest award that a soldier can get for valor in action yeah, and it hasn't been ratified they still stand yeah those congressional bells of honor when they were in, uh, asking me to join the forces i said uh, well why should we why should we join you you haven't uh, accounted for what you did to us mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our people don't know that, and certainly most America does not know that those congressional of honor are still standing there today. They're on the banner of the Seventh Cavalry. That's a you know just just one segment of a history. Now you want to go back and. <laughs> and go through the massacres and go through the battles that's never told to the American public, to the, to the, to the American student, Canadian student, 
It's not in your history. No. But it is in your history. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're here today. Yeah. That's why you're here. You want to adjust to that. You want to adjust that history because we are in an existential crisis of survival right now as we sit here. I agree. And if you want to survive and you want your children to survive and you want a future, you have to change. Because mm -hmm. what's going on right now is taking taking all of us. It's destroying life as we know it. So I think it's important that uh, Nedra has gathered this up and talk about uh, one of our our heroes. Absolutely. I mentioned uh, I mentioned to her that I have always had two heroes that I looked up to in my from our native peoples. And one was Jim Thorpe. He's always been, uh, you know, my hero just simply because he was so, so great a person himself. He did so many things. And, um, and the other is uh, Tecumseh. Tecumseh's trying to reunite the whole Confederacy. Understood what was coming. His, uh, his brother undid him. But uh, that's, you know, that's just a history. It is what it is. And so I think as we face this crisis of survival, it's important for humanity to understand that we are all related. We are one family. We are a species. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. now what's happened, what's happened is, of course, is in this process, racism has has uh, always been the foundation of this country based on race. And you call white privilege, white supremacy, sure is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a privilege, you know, you're born with a white face, you can walk into anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you're born with a brown face, uh, <laughs> never mind a black face, mm -hmm. you're not welcome. You're not welcome. That's the foundation of this country. And they lied to you when they told you that this was the birthplace of democracy. No, the birthplace of democracy has always been here with our native people. You know, it was free. Everybody was free. And um, going back to one of our leaders, I depended on so much, you know, Audrey Shenandoah, clan mother. And, and she was just a, a great patriot of our, of our Confederacy. And uh, she could speak all the Six Nation languages. She, she was fortunate, her and her, her brother, Paul Waterman, who sat on a council of chiefs. Uh, he was principal chief. Uh, or the title that I sit under, I was his helper. And that's where I've been. Paul was, um, it was the leader. He could speak all the languages. I was a helper. And uh, I was his assistant. But we have, you know, we have a principal and then we have a, uh, a faith keeper who steps by and work that we work together. So I've been in that position for 55 years now. So I've seen a few things and I've watched the earth change. When I was born in 1930, you were, you know, horse and buggy. It was a horse and buggy in 1930. And today there's people circulating the earth in a, in a capsule all within my lifetime. Wow. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. That is. But it's always been a question to me is, where is our brother's common sense? He's, he's wedded to dollars and cents. There's no doubt about that. Your whole, your whole 
public is related to dollars and cents. And that's why we are where we are today. Because dollars and cents is what rules countries, what rules civilizations today. And where is the spiritual side of that? Where is this woman who was dancing this morning? Where is that for the rest mm -hmm. of the world? And that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. You're here to, to acknowledge that there's a dimension, probably the fundamental dimension for existence as a species that's lacking in the whole uh, governance of the earth today, no matter what country you are. Interesting to me, you know, we've been overrun. Uh, Turtle Island here has been overrun by our brothers from across the water. But there's outposts, there's people, there's original people there. They call us Indians, you know, that was the first mistake. They thought they were in India, so all of a sudden we're, we're Indians. And, and we still are. And when I, when I, in my international travel, run across a person from India, I have to uh, acknowledge to him that he's the real Indian. And I do. I said, well, you're the real Indian. Oh, I'm glad to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, they called Turtle Island America. They named it after an Italian, Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian, a whole continent. Our brothers from across the water have a propensity to name places after themselves. And probably native people <laughs> would never, ever <laughs> think of doing something so Excellent outrageous. Point. <laughs> Excellent point. Why, why name, is that even a thing? Why, yeah. To name a mountain after somebody. Yeah, myself. insane. Yeah. Well, that gives you an idea of who's running this world. Totally. You have that kind of thinking, you're in trouble. And so here we are. I agree. I think it's because that kind of thinking. It's a domination attitude, and uh, and they're everybody's concerned more about owning things than partnering with them and just having a relationship. And who needs your name on a mountain? That's insane. That's ridiculous. I like, I don't I don't understand that. No, it's simple to understand. <laughs> yeah, it's it is. I just don't agree. I guess I understand well, it. <laughs> I don't agree with it. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to hear you say that because yeah. when you get everybody saying that, we might have a chance. Exactly. exactly. That's what this yeah. is about. Man, thank you so much. You are, I could listen to you talk all day. Well, you um, have to tell me to shut up because I keep talking too much. I don't think anybody here is going to. I'm not going to ask any more of these questions. Like you're answering everything that uh, that we're even outlining by just by just running. This is uh yeah, this is amazing. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, man, this is this is awesome. That was incredible. Can I jump in and contribute and and contribute all, to and add on by, more to his? By all um, means, this is fantastic. Well, first, I want to talk about that science and uh, being a geographer, geography and science are the first um, disciplines that created a structure, you know, that that names and claims and, and uh, erases others and, you know, erase and replaces the system, right? So science yeah. in general is grounded in co-opted, mis or disappropriated knowledges, plagiarized as discoveries, right? By mm -hmm. colonists, which are dead white men and settler colonists, which now we can include other white people and other uh, colon colonizers that mm -hmm. used their methods and their methodologies to subjugate othered peoples and justify genocide, slavery, 
theft of land, water, and all of the beings and the bodies is bodies of place, both human and more than human. So let's just start there, right? Mm. Place to um, a non-indigenous person or to a colonizer is is a noun, you know, person, place, or thing, object. Where for an indigenous person, it's an adjective and a verb. It's a who, a whom. You know, it's yeah. multiple beings that have uh, agency and contribute to a complex structure that is the pattern and systems of the life of that place's character, its personality, its identity. And we are part of that ecosystem. And if we don't recognize that, we, what, you know, what happens to the earth happens to our bodies. And since colonization has claimed everything and made this, you know, this idea of dominion over others, this is why we have missing and murdered indigenous women. This is why native people have the highest incarceration and murder rates because, you know, nobody, you know, they, they don't even bother counting us because per capita, the numbers would blow their minds, but because we are such, they got us down to 1% ish, uh, as opposed to the 100% that we started when they uh, were lost and found upon our shores and we fed mm -hmm. them and sheltered them. Um, there has become this uh, idea of this uh, romanticized stereotype, you know, pristine myth and this savage, you know, and, and Oren is right. We are not teaching the people in this country about how this country has been founded because had they truly uh, utilized our democracies in, in at least the basic foundations, they would not have the problems they would have because women were not subjugated. We were equal, if not, you know, matrilineal matriarchal societies, you know, there was more balance. And there was this respect for where our food comes and this reverence of, of spirituality and recognizing the, the energy. Everything has an electron and everything has an energy mm -hmm. because of that electron. So that means everything has life and must be treated as a relative. As, you know, Dan Wildcat's always saying, these are our relatives. These are not our resources. And we need to have those relationships <laughs> that are such. And the other thing that Dan's always, you know, going on about that, that, um, that I absolutely love and, and I'm gracious I'm just so honored and humbled that Dan has been my mentor for so long is that, you know, we, these are not, we don't have a right to clean water. We don't have a right to clean air. We do not have a right to a healthy ecosystem. We have a responsibility to that, to those Word. things. These are our responsibilities. These are our relatives. This is our grandmother. And if you keep robbing your grandma's purse and stealing from her house and selling it, and what is left? Yeah. What is left but a sick, poor, dying grandmother? And that's what the earth, where the earth is at right now. Yeah. There are parts of the ocean that are dead. There are ecosystems in the Bering Sea that have collapsed and there's the Alaska natives you can't scream loud enough for the world to hear it. The whole Gulf Coast where the Mississippi runs into the Gulf is dead. It is a dead zone. There's no life. The Mississippi River is so polluted from, you know, I put down tobacco with Winona Leduc at the headwaters of the, of the Mississippi up in Minnesota and we, we put a prayer down. When, when Standing Rock happened, I went up there and I prayed for the water because at the time I was, um, you know, I'm at University of Kansas. So that water runs past where I go to school, you know, and, and millions of people all the way. That water used to be drinkable. <laughs> I don't, you can't even get in the water and know you won't be sick because it has become the dumping ground. The most precious resource on this earth is a dumping ground. Yeah. That's where That's we have crazy. to start. We have to really address how we care for this land, yeah. each other, and all of our relationship because Hank Ferguson, Hawaiian elder, holy man, told me a hula song about a hula song, hundreds of hundreds, if not thousands of years old, about the raindrop having a right to return to the seas. And the whole song is about the hydrology process. Mm -hmm. The science, indigenous science is not only, oh, we don't huge, need to be legitimized. Yeah. 
We don't need no. to be, it's already been it's real. proven. Right. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. why we've survived and that's it. We have survived because we have cared for place. Even as a Shawnee who called the, the Iroquois and this Confederated Nations trouble because, you know, they always gave us trouble back in the day. <laughs> we all understood that even as the Shawnee moved from place to place and we were a trades tribe, we'd go away, we'd come back. We took relatives with us and replaced so that nurtured those relatives in another place so that if ever we're there again, we have the, the, the trees we need for ceremony, the plants we need for food that will nourish the animals that we use. So, you know, it's, it's recognizing the responsibility to the place. Maybe John would like to ask the next question to move forward, do you think, or um, yeah. good with that, uh, Zach, is that all right? He's, oh, for he's, sure. He's, I mean, honestly, like it, we're getting all the answers we need in this, like, <laughs> this is beautiful. I just, this is how I like things to go anyway. Okay. It's not, I mean, yeah. I mean I it's like John, John talks all the time about, uh, yeah. um, about like specifically like native youth being you know future consultants to to companies that want to like i i think there's just such a there's a really beautiful mix in in taking um the knowledge that uh that um that the indigenous people like particularly in this country have had about this land forever and then with the technologies that we know now and somewhere in the middle, somewhere like building a bridge in between that, you can like really find, I think the most powerful things. And I truly do think that that is like when you were talking about all the things that you study in like uh, in geography and things like, like putting sometimes in, in studies, you really learn how to you understand feelings that you always had, but you can put it into words and honestly just learn how to communicate them better. And so we just learn how to listen, how to speak more. And like with all this, like these questions, like, you know, what is the earth telling us? And like you're saying, like the water is polluted. There's dead zones. There is no life. Mother earth is speaking to us loud as hell. And and I don't know, what do you, um, like, what do you think needs to happen? Like, what are the things that, uh, that, that you think we need to do? Or an or Paulette. Oh, well. First steps. I, I think uh, the first thing you have to do is, uh, is understand, uh, what pollution does and, and uh, that you have to understand that uh, we, we in the beginning were, were given a pristine uh, planet. We, we were given uh, an opportunity to, to live. And when I use the word live, uh, I mean, enjoy life. And all you had to do was, was to be responsible and your life. And then you have, uh, if you get in the rhythm of the earth, uh, one, uh, one point, uh, to illustrate the point, one point uh, that we're, we're having a discussion somewhere. And somebody said to me, uh, well, what, what's your bottom line? And it, it stopped me, you know, because I never thought about that. I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, what's my bottom line. I said, I have to think about that. And I did. I said, I, I'm, if you give me some time, I said, I'll try to, to, to find that answer, but I can't do that right now. Okay, so think about it. And I did. Then of course the terminology bottom line is business. Mm -hmm. That's business. That's total business. Money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's your. That's the end of the day. You know what's there at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's business. Oh, it's ridiculous. And, and then I related that to to what I knew about our nations, and I said, 
we don't have a bottom line. We, we live in a circle. We live in a cycle. Spring, yeah, that's good. Uh, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter. It's a cycle. It's a circle. It goes on and on and on. There's no end to it. As long as you uh, perform in that laws and rules of that circle, it's, it's forever. And I uh, said, so we, well, my answer to him is, well, we don't have a bottom line. When you ask me what's my bottom line, we don't have one. Uh, so, and, and when you have come from a traditional nation like myself and Indian nations across, across everywhere, basically, you know, all have different languages, you know, there's so many different nations, I, I think, I think they, they talk about 575 different nations today, indigenous nations in um, North America, Central and South America, and um, all with uh, different languages, different styles of life, depending on, on where you live. Uh, but what I found out over time was that our ceremonies all recognized one thing. We, we, we all uh, understood nature and we all understood where the reality was and that all those ceremonies, all those different songs, all those different languages all said the same thing. So that when we have a gathering, when indigenous people have a gathering and a speaker speaks, we, we don't understand literally what the speaker is saying because it's a different language, but we know he's mm -hmm. saying the same thing. We know that. So he can speak for all of us. That's what's what happened this morning. That dance this morning was speaking for all of us. Mm -hmm. we, and when I understand that dance. I watch her shuffle. You see, when the women dance, they shuffle and they tell us that's because they're caressing the earth, their mother, their feet, because the earth is female and they're caressing the earth. That's how they dance. The men, we dance different, you know, we, we dance different. And, uh, and that relates back to what we were told, which is women are in charge of water, which is in charge of life men in charge of fire. And as you know, water will put fire out. So water prevails. The earth is water, the earth is female. And I would say there's law. The earth is law, there's rules to the earth and, and, and you can't mitigate those rules. You can't adjust them. All you can do is adhere to them. And uh, if you don't adhere to them, you suffer a consequence. And that's where we are today. You've violated, you know, fundamental rule. You know, the part, what I can see is that the present civilizations have built fortunes on plundering the earth. You're plundering the earth. You're digging everything out of the earth. You're digging everything, oil, so forth. Uh, that's like cutting off your own arm. It's, 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 it's um, not recognizing uh, what you're doing. The, what I see lacking with our brothers from across the water is a real comprehension of the spiritual side of life. Uh, they talk about religion, but pretty corrupt religions, I see. You know, I can go on into some other uh, stories that relate to that, but I, I don't want to do that because it's... Uh, it's not helpful right now. 
This is so helpful. I think we have to really um, have this conversation because uh, Zach, I know you're building a house and building a house is huge. It is hard work. And, um, and like you say, well, I got this far uh, and you're gonna finish the house. We at Onondaga, we have to do that. We build a house at Onondaga. Uh, we have to build it board by board because we're outside of the jurisdiction of uh, US law. In other words, we don't have, we can't borrow money at Onondaga from a bank. You can't go to a bank and borrow money because they can't foreclose on you. They can't come and take something away from you. So we've had to build our own homes board by board, just like you're doing. And, um, but when you build it and it's finished, it's yours. You don't owe anybody. So at Onondaga, there is not one mortgage, not one. The banks are not in charge here. And that's because <laughs> we've got homes half built. <laughs> we've got people living in the cellars, like just like you, <laughs> you know, because that's what we have to do. But they have created a system where you have to go to the bank and pay for your house three times over. Mm -hmm. By the time that 30 year mortgage is done, you paid for your house three times. That's well, at least that's, that's, that's thievery, um, outright thievery. And they've got a system built on that. And you agree to that. You walk in, you know, to the banker's office and he puts a chain around your neck and he puts a chain onto his desk. Yep. And you're 30 years. And you made a promise. What you said was, if you give me this money and I don't pay you back, you can take everything I have. That's what, that's what you signed. That's ridiculous. That's probably a stupid move of me. You're right. But that's, you know, you're going to have to deal with that. How do you, yeah. how do you deal with that? How do yeah. you deal with fairness? That's not fair. No. And this, this country here is built on, on, I'm talking about the U.S. now, built on middlemen. And uh, why in the world should a student at a university be saddled with $80,000 debt to go to a university? Why? It's it's uh, it's thievery. Mm -hmm. It's indenture. You've indentured people. You know the same university and the same uh, information. If you go to a place like a university of, of uh, in Sweden, the University of Lund. It's free. It's free. You don't pay any tuition. Yeah. It can be done. I mean, they do it, you know. I know. Yeah. Why is it? If you go to Harvard University or Yale, you know what kind of a bankroll they have? You have any idea how much money they have stacked up? I imagine a Billions of dollars. And they demand more from you as a student. It's not right. So here we are now, a uh, consequence of all of that. Uh, at some point, you know, it's like musical chairs. At some point, there's one left standing. And that's us. We're standing there. And uh, everybody's sitting down, which is Earth itself. And we as a species are standing here out now. We're out. And we may not survive as a species because 
our principles of, of uh, living is based on money. Simple. Mm -hmm. It's not based on humanity. It's not based on on those what this young woman was dancing about. It's not based on the spiritual understanding of our our work on this side. We're supposed to be working uh, with we're supposed to be working with with the powers of, of nature. We're we're part of we're nature. We're the same as nature. So the only thing that's different, and it's, it's a big difference <laughs> between human beings and uh, say the Buffalo nation or the, uh, the deer nation or the fish nation or the eagle nation is that we have a foreknowledge of death. We know at some point that we're gonna die. We learned that early in life at some point we're, we're, we're going to die. We have a foreknowledge of death. And we have an intellect that allows us to speak to one another. And so uh, we're a species, we're, we're, we're the human species, right? And we've been given this huge responsibility of intellect and the foreknowledge of death. And we haven't used it correctly. We've misused it and it's brought us to this point of our own extinction. If we're so smart, if we're so intelligent as they keep telling us how smart we are, why are we facing our own extinction as a species? How smart is that? How brilliant is that? And in the face of that, continue to do what's not right. As we are speaking today, and we're worried about what's gonna to happen to our, our, our children and ourselves, but basically, you know, what our people, what we call seven generations, that's forward thinking, seven generations. That's way forward thinking. I'm talking about a generation of a person, 80 years, not, you know, uh, civilization today shortcuts everything. So your generation today is 20 years. 20 years, you're still a child. Between birth and 20, you're still a child. 20 to 30, you begin to learn something. 30 to 40, you have children. Then you become a parent. 40 to 50, you become a leader in your community. 50 to 60, you're a leader internationally. And then you become an elder, supposed to be helping the younger ones. That's cycle. That's not what you do, though. So you're saying that 20 years, you're, you're just a child. You're just learning anywhere in between that. So your perspectives are not correct. And I'm talking about now when I say you're, I'm talking about the European thought. Because you're still here. You've only been here five days. Our brothers from across, you've only been here five days. And look what you have done. Look at the damage you have done in five days because we can count a day as a hundred years, or we can count a day as a year, or we can count a day as a day. That's our perspective. So I'm using the broad perspective. You've been here five days. Look, the damage. Look where we are. So I think, you know, going back to the origin of this talk altogether with uh, Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe, he, he was an amazing person. There's just no doubt about it. He was a super athlete, but we've had a lot of super athletes. We've just never had a, a chance to contest 
and he got into the contest. That's what that's what made him different. He got into the international contest and he ran over everybody. But that's because they're very strong and our people were very strong in the same way. Exceptionally strong, spirit and mind body. And uh, we were outsiders. We we're outsiders, you know. And um, Jim, he surmounted all of that. He, he crashed into the white world. That's what he did. He crashed into the white world. And the king, Gustav, Sweden said, you are the greatest athlete in the world. You know what he said? Thanks, king. <laughs> That's what he said, thanks, king. He bowed his head to nobody. We bow our head to nobody. Nobody. We are who we are. We're equal. And that's been the battle. So now, taking all Indian land and removing the indigenous people, and not accounting for 16 million people here in North America from uh, the landfall of Christopher Columbus. What happened to 16 million people? They talk about the Holocaust. They talk about what happened to the Jewish problem. And look what happened to them. But it's the same system. The Nazis, this idea of white supremacy. Today, here in America, you have American youth, American people wearing a swastika. They don't remember what happened in the Second World War. They're too far removed. What happened around the world with that swastika? Terrible, terrible. Caused the whole battle around the world all day. Millions of lives were lost under that swastika. And now we have American youth, American young people running around with a swastika. But this country's always been tickling with that whole idea. Always been underneath fascism. It's been there, it's surfacing again now. But that comes from white supremacy. That's where that comes from. It's not understanding that even though human beings come in all colors and all sizes, that's, I, I use a simile all the time, like we're like dogs, come in all colors, all sizes and all shapes, but we're all dogs. We're all human. We're one species. We're family. And until we learn to live like family, we're in this existential crisis now because of that. So Jim Thorpe, he, he fought his way through all of that. It just couldn't contain him. He was just too, too good. He was too good. You know, once we started to compete against our brother as a unit, which was, you know, what was happening at Carlisle, all Indians on one team. That's where group. my that's where my great grandfather met Jim Thorpe was at Carlisle. My grandfather was playing football. My great grandfather Lee Blanchard, and um, Nedra and I had this discussion the other day. But um, Oren, there's some questions online from some of the viewers that I'm going to ask Nedra or one of our other hosts to ask because I think your responses are going to be amazing. I am. If anybody who knows me knows that I'm usually kind of a, 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 a take over the situation talking because I get so excited and I'm passionate about what I do and I, um, I've i been blessed to be taught by Billy Frank and, and my grandmother and Jim Thorpe were good friends and um, as a matter of fact when Jim got divorced from his second wife Frida uh, he and his three boys moved in with my grandparents in Los Angeles and so Jim was part of 
you know, an extended part of our family. We weren't related by blood by any means, uh, but we were um, related by community and the fact that we were all, we're all Algonquin dialect re relatives. And so every time we talk about Jim Thorpe, I just, it reminds me of my grandma and some of the things that she used to tell us about there being, you know, a men's, a men's season and a women's season. Well, there's also periods of time where men rule and lead. And then there's periods of time where the feminine, and I don't want to say this as a binary because it was a masculine feminine, you know, spectrum. And she would say that we've been in a very masculine dominant uh, era for many, many years. And it's hard for the men sometimes to let go, especially with colonization. But back, you know, in our, in our old ways that it was normal for the women made the decisions on if we went to war or not. The women made decisions about a lot of things. And I think that's one of the things that has been missing for generations, but is trying to come back is this gender balance, this gender spectrum balance and recognition of, of all of our intersectionalities and all of them are needed in this um, fight to preserve and protect um, our, our culture, our language, our foods, our relatives and our way of life and just existing. Cause I had an Alaska elder tell me, you know, you science, climate scientists, we can't adapt. It's happened, you know, we're too far to adapt. We need to learn to survive climate change. So please Nedra. Yeah, thank you for yeah. that Paulette. And I did want to let our viewers know that um, we didn't lock in a, in time, but we appreciate you hanging with us. Uh, this is so extremely interesting and uh, appreciate you being with us. And again, um, I, there is one of the, um, Zach, if you want to ask the question about the teachings, I, that was actually one of the questions we were going to cover. And that is somebody wanting to know how can we unlearn and relearn. Yeah, so, exactly. And, yeah. And I, think, and I know that Oren would be glad to speak to that. And I think that's what Paulette was asking, because again, it's the, you know, we've been in this environment, even in some native communities and non-native communities in and out of, the, of these different communities so how do you how do we go forward how do we move yeah. move it forward yeah uh, michelle montgomery asked uh specifically said thank you very much for your teachings and uh would you offer advice for how we can all unlearn and relearn knowledge um or the and the the uh inherit that uh, that amount of responsibility because unlearning is oftentimes harder than learning. Well, what what you have, um, what you have in your hands, which we don't have, is numbers. Uh, indigenous people, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what they say, how many of us are here today, maybe 2 million left out of that 16 original million. And we've been building our way back. Uh, a census taken in 1900 said that there were 250,000 Native people left in the United States. And their count, down from 16 million. Down from 16 million. But so you guys have the numbers. You're, you're actually in charge. So it's your leadership. you got to change your leadership. You have to put in, in leadership position people with the values that we're talking about. Probably the worst leader that you have today from my perspective is Mitch McConnell. Terrible man. Terrible. Totally dedicated to money. Mm -hmm. He's not dedicated to the people. No. But he's in charge. He's in charge. You got to deal with him. Now, how do you deal with him? You raise good leaders. Be careful who you vote for. You have people out there running around with American flags waving at a virus. That's nature. Nature, <laughs> you're not going to pay any attention to a flag. I don't care whose flag it is. You got a virus out there. You got nature now moving doing what it's going to do, which is to bring down the human population because we've overrun the earth. We have 7.7 .7 billion people in the world today. We've forced no land left for the tigers, no land left for the gorillas. 
we have names for gorillas today because that's how few are left. Can you imagine? We have names for, and they're soon, they're gonna be gone. You know, you, you've destroyed life all the way around and the only left is people. So then you destroy yourself. And that's the process going on right now. How do you level 7.7 .7 billion people? Well, nature knows how. But we nature can, knows how that. We, yeah, we cannot science or geoengineer our, our way out of everything. We, we, we can't, we're humans. We're not, we're human beings, not, you know, you know, we should be human doings and be actually proactive in like lawns to gardens, uh, urban spaces made, uh, so that there's food, you know, there's this whole food revolution that we need to like support the heirloom, heirloom seeds, you know, what plants in your area that you live are indigenous to that place and bring those relatives back and support them, let them, they, they were there for a reason, they had a job mm -hmm. in that space, and they had a relationship to the other plants and insects and animals of that place. And I think that's something that's super important is, is recognizing that, you know, food is a crisis. I think this pandemic has made us see that. And, and it reminds me of you know, stories that my grandmother would tell about how Jim Thorpe would go around and collect money to, to buy food for Indian families that were starving, that had come one way ticket with the Indian relocation plan to Los Angeles. And um, you know, I remember a story about one young mother that her, her, she was literally wearing flour sacks as clothes and her children were both sick and Jim just started emptying his pockets and took his hat and went around and collected money to get medicine for those children and food and clothes. I mean, and that's the kind of the, you know, thing that needs to happen is we need to start caring for each other. We need to start um, nurturing environment and place and, and build in a way that is be not sustainable, but restorative. We need restorative science. We need restorative building. Yeah. We need convergence and convergent sciences and interdisciplinary and multicultural and intergenerational knowledge to be holistic because taking Western science likes to take things apart to the most minute point and try to understand it, but they never put it back together. And indigenous people have always seen the pattern and always known the, the, the system. And we looked for the outliers where Western science is, ah, oh, outlier, mistake, ignore it because it doesn't fit into what I'm trying to prove. But indigenous people knew those, those, those things be outside of the pattern, those anomalies. That's evolution or revolution. Either way, that was something that we should pay attention to because we might need to incorporate whatever that thing is doing that is different, that it's gonna make it survive something we may not know is coming. And that's the difference is being present in place, being responsible to place, being engaged and accountable, not only to your to yourself and your in community, but to your ancestors and definitely accountable to those yet to come. You know, we gotta look forward and make sure that we are leaving it better than we found it. And and white people need to just just give it up and and just concede the power. The, the hubris of science is coming to an end and we are watching the last death kick throws of a system that is broken. It's, it's, it's never meant to work, but the potential to, to, to work together to create a system that does is now because we are past a tipping point. It's about surviving what has happened over the past uh, industrial revolution because we are in the Anthropocene where humans have made such an impact on this earth that it has changed the earth for how long we're not even we have we can't even fully wrap our heads around it but our arrogance especially American nationalism and this idea of white supremacy and this idea of of control and this it, it's just gotta it's just gotta stop mm -hmm. I guess I was raised with um, something pretty simple growing up and it's pretty simple and I know Oren will know about this and I think the hardest lesson that all of us learn and one is remember to remember that was my mother's from the Cherokee side of our family and my father's was 
Always be respectful of the four-legged and the two-legged, but remember you're a two-legged. And remember that because you have responsibilities, major responsibilities to this earth. So, well, there was, uh, in, that, in that regard, um, what your mother said was, was a law, a rule. Respect is, is a law among mm -hmm. Indian nations. Respect is a law. And so uh, is another law, which is to share. Uh, this, this system that's in charge today, uh, capitalism is not democratic. Capitalism is not democracy. Everybody has to understand. It took me a long time to understand terminology, but capitalism is not democracy. And democracy was supposed to control the capitalists. That's reversed now. Capitalism is in charge. Democracy is, uh, has failed at this point. I see it, uh, the 1775 agreement that we made with the Continental Congress, which was to support our way of life. They said to us at that time, to the Six Nation Confederacy, which was meeting with Albany, 1775, on the eve of the revolution. They said, we are going to challenge our father. He is mistreating us. He has not been fair to us. He has left us no choice. And they went on, they went on to, to tell us how, how badly they were being treated. And then they said, we want you to join us in this battle against our father. That's 1775. And our leader says, well, we know your father. As a matter of fact, we were just talking with him this spring in Oswego at a fort, Oswego. Oh, really, what did he say? Well, he said, basically what you're saying, there's a fight coming. We want you to join us. What did you say? He said, it's not a good idea to get inside a family fight. Anybody well knows, you step inside a family fight, they're both going to turn on you. So we're going to stand to the side. Good, they said, because that was our second request. If you're not going to fight with us, don't fight against us. And that's the Treaty of 1775. In 1983, in 1983, uh, the President Reagan was reorganizing the draft, and he was, and our, our men were getting draft notices, and uh, they came to the chiefs and they said, "Hey, I thought we had an agreement that uh, we don't have to fight no more." Yes, we do. Well, look, we're getting this notice. And we said to the men, don't ignore them. Bring the notices to us and we will answer them. And that's what happened in 1983. The young men would bring these notices to get in the mail to be drafted and we'd send a letter and say, these men are not eligible. And so on Mother's Day in 1983, uh, we had a meeting at Onondaga with the U.S. government and with the Selective Service Commission. And they had called us earlier that year and they said, uh, we're getting these letters back. And we know that, they're, that uh, Genesis is, is not new. We know that, but we don't know where, where, what is it? Where does it come from? And we said, well, you know, we, we have all that information. So the meeting was set up with the U.S. government at Onondaga, at our long house in 1983. And they came, big black limousines filled with federal people from the, from the United States government to come and discuss with us. We were prepared. Our men were lined up behind the... Uh, treaty belts 
We had wampum belts laid out. And uh, they came in, the longhouse. And we said, you ask us a question. You said, tell us what is the genesis of her. So we said, well, in, in 1775, we made a treaty of neutrality. And you said to us at that time, if you don't take part in this battle coming, then we will do all your fighting for you and you'll never have to raise your arm again in the future. And we said to them at that time that we would not join this battle as a confederation of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, uh, nor would we join the battle as nations independent, the uh, Oneida, the Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, Tuscarora, Mohawk. We will not. But you will see our men in the field because their minds are split. You will see people on both sides. But when you see them there, understand they're there on their own. They're not representing us. And we will agree. So we made a treaty. So 1983, that's not long ago. Some of you might even been born by that time. And I was a speaker and our, our men were lined up and the treaty belts were laid out from the two row wampum, 1613. Our first treaty between white people and native people, peace and friendship, two row belt and on and on to that belt, 1775 belt, neutrality. We said, we made an agreement, be neutral. So by the time we took the history to the 1812, and we hadn't even been finished yet, we were on our way. They said, okay, okay, we understand. We asked you a question, you have answered the question, and we agree, and we will not draft your men. That's 1983. That's contemporary time. When you're having this big fight up in the Adirondacks, 17, 17, 1975, huge battle going on up there. We came to, came to us again, help us out. And we did. We worked with the federal government on those treaties, 1975. And we settled that up there without a fight. Instead of having a shooter war, we settled that. 1975. This is contemporary time. Those treaties stand. 19 or 2016, we were invited to the White House and they renewed our 1794 treaty at the White House four years ago. They renewed that treaty. Peace, friendship forever. And they say we're not a nation. Of course we're a nation. That's what treaties are about. The treaties are between nations. Yes, we are. And here we are. So the promises are there. They just haven't been acted on. Right. And if we, we could get the United States to follow their own laws and follow their own rules that they made, that's a start, right? They made those rules. They wrote these papers. We just signed them. If they can follow their own promises, honor their own word, that's a start too. That's uh, how many treaties are there? Holy smoke. They have a treaty upon treaties. 375 that they have noted plus more, more agreements. They just have broken every one of them, every single one. That's why today uh, they can't trust the American word. Anybody will tell you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you look at what was happening in Syria and what's happening in the, the Middle East, the big wars there, and I, I, I just shook my head at this administration 
when they threw their allies to the dogs. You know, those people that were fighting on our side over there, they just threw them, this president just threw them to the dogs. Can't trust these people in the world. You know, the Indian, we used to shake hands. We used to sit down together and we never wrote anything down. Sometimes we would pick a belt, but basically it was our word. And they made fun of us, you know, they make fun of us. They sort of call us, they call us honest, honest engine. And they say that with a smirk, huh? honest engine. He's so stupid, he's honest. The other thing they tell us, hey, you better get it in writing. You can't trust his word. Get it in writing. That's that's contemporary. Get it in writing because you can't trust what he's going to do. Well, you know, that has brought us to where we are today. And we brought us to this uh, point of uh, extinction as a species. So principle is something you can't modify. You can't modify a principle. You either have it or you don't. Peace is peace. It's not an absence of war, it's peace. The real peace, not an absence of war. It means in your heart, in your being, at peace. That's a big word, you know. They've, they've vilified the Haudenosaunee. They call us warriors, fighters. If you look at our, our main wampum, our flag in the center, the great tree of peace, there it is. Way 1600 years ago, that, that's that. We're based on peace, we're not based on war. But they'll tell you, oh, those are your they're fierce, they fight, they do all that. <laughs> No, that's defense of your house. When somebody comes in your house, you're going to stand and fight. That's what Indian nations did. You're going to stand and fight. Somebody comes in your house, kicks your door down. Hey, you do that, you're asking for it. All right, and that's what they did. They kicked our door down, came in the house, and they stood and fought. Well, like I say, you can't take land from a good guy. So they made us bad guys. And that's after, after our land. How do you come from across the water and then say, this belongs to us and ignore the original people? How do you do that? You make them bad guys, pesky redskins. You know, you know they tip trains over, you know, they have wagon trains that they circle. <laughs> The killers. And you make them less than human. Always. You dehumanize them. Yeah. Always. That was by treaty. That was by treaty. You know, 1493, the Pope issued a declaration. And he said, in these new lands you have discovered, if there are people there, uh, and they are not Christian. Uh, they are not in charge. And if, uh, if there are no Christian nations there, then this, these lands belong to us by right of discovery. That's the Pope, 1493. One year after, he just annexed the whole Western Hemisphere simply by fiat, simply by statement. He said, these lands are empty because there's no Christians there. Empty land, terra nullius, got a name for it. Old Rome, old Roman terra nullius, empty land, now belongs to us. And they were moving around the world this Christian hegemony. Moving There's a magic the word there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
and went around Africa, India, left a mess everywhere they were. The islands in the Pacific, Australia, ran up across China. China stood still standing, still standing. So here we are. What are you going to do about it? Well, I think, you know, my hero, which is Jim Thorpe, <laughs> uh, I just I just admire what he did, you know, he was so great. And, and a good man, a good man. I mean, after, I mean, I, I, I had to, uh, now that I understand it, I had the great honor to shake his hand. Uh, you know, I had the great honor to shake Tim Sorb's hand. And, uh, Orin, describe describe your interaction with uh, Jim Thorpe. You described exactly how it felt when you held his hand. It's well, you know, Jim Thorpe was uh, he was managing a, a Mohawk uh, wrestler by the name of Sonny Warcloud, and the, the wrestlers had a circuit. They would go around different cities and they would wrestle. And when they came to uh, Syracuse that have, uh, you know, a big wrestling night down there. And Jim would always come out to Onondaga because his teammates, his classmates were my great uncles. They were there at Carlisle. Uh, my uncle, Ike Lyon, Ike Lyons, he was on the football team with Jim Sorb. Jesse Lyon, those are my uncles. They were on the same football team with so he knew them. And he would always, you know, as soon as he come in Syracuse, he'd come right to Onondaga. And um, at that time, uh, we were practicing. I was a goalkeeper for the Onondaga Nation uh, lacrosse team. And we were practicing in our box. And who comes comes over to watch the practice? But, you know, my, my great uncle Jesse, Jesse Lyon and, and Jim Thorpe. And uh, somebody says, hey, that's Jim Thorpe. I said, what? So we stopped and the whole team went over, you know. And I had a chance to shake his hand, you know, because I knew all about him. And, and we all held him as a, as a great uh, example of what we all would want to be. And there he was, you know. He wasn't that, that tall. I, I was surprised, you know. But, you know, old age takes you down. But he had a huge paw. When I shook hands with him, holy crap, <laughs> he said, no, just took my whole hand over. <laughs> and he was, he didn't uh, see much. He was a very quiet man. Very quiet man. He didn't say much, but he liked, you know, uh, watching us play lacrosse. And uh, my, they, my uncle and him we were talking. And um, I said, it was hard for me to to really uh, describe how how I felt when when mm -hmm. he was standing there. How this great man, who I really revered as as a leader, as an example of what I would like to be like, there he was. Oh, it's oh. hard to hard to describe, but it was a great moment for us. Our team were so lucky to shake. He he passed on the following year. Yeah. He passed on the following year. Fifty-three. Yeah. yeah. Oren, thank yeah. you, thank you so much for sharing that because, you know, we're all working on the movie and the, everything, and to hear that personal touch and discussion is, means the world to me, and I know our other team, uh, the rest of the team at Bright Path and, and the world, because uh, not many people here, even though my father and he were very, very good friends and related, um, you know, I never met him, of course. And I know that some of the stories that were passed down, but it's just so great that you shared that with everybody. And, and I wanna thank you and Paulette for, you know, what an honor it was to listen to you and Oren especially, I've known for many years and 
I can't wait to get up to Onondaga and let's go take the families and go to watch a good lacrosse team play, okay? I miss it. I miss being up there every fall, coming to visit all of you and please give my love to everyone. And Paulette, uh, we are counting on you to get your PhD and come back and uh, we're gonna have to have you back and, and thank you for all your hard work and um, you know your your pride in your voice and what you're doing and and uh, you know we're with you we're behind you you have great shoulders to stand on to get it done and we're counting on that thank you so much oh, no, Zach and uh, Rich John and and uh, Zach um, you know if you want to uh, share a little bit with the folks about PTM and how they can reach you and the foundation if you want to do that before we close out that would be great. Sure, just uh, just PTM. You can find us online across social media, and then um, PTMFoundation.org um, is where we. Uh, if you're looking to get get in some stuff to donate to to make a difference, and uh, yeah, come come join the team. Jump on in. The water's fine, and uh, and yeah, thank thank you so much for having us. Um, I can't wait to just listen to this recording again. Uh, all you guys. Um, it was an honor. Wow. What, uh, there, there are things that I heard in this conversation that I will take, you know, that will be with me every day until I die. So thank you so much. That was truly life-changing. That's great. Well, I, I hate to close it. It's just, I can feel it through the, the virtual being here of, of the good thoughts and goodwill, but I want to remind everybody to, uh, pray for mother earth, work together, reach out in your communities. Uh, don't think you can't get involved. You must get involved. There, there's really no choice that we have at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, if, you, if you feel like you need support, reach out in your communities to those uh, organizations that are doing things and reach out to us at Bright Path Strong. You know, we'll, we'll help direct you in the right direction if you need that. But again, um, know that uh, you know, Mother Earth is there. She needs us. And um, we are working busy, busy, busy at brightpathstrong.com. Uh, if you haven't signed our petition uh, to restore the winning records that were officially awarded to Jim Thorpe in the 1912 Olympics, please do. Uh, we're working very hard with our US rep, a wonderful African-American woman that is the vice president of the International Olympic Committee and I give her a big shout out. Uh, so, you know, it's hopeful, but uh, we're not gonna stand on hopeful. We're gonna make sure it gets done. So mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you very much. And again, here's my coffee mug from brightpathstrong.com. And I was gonna wear my t-shirt, but it didn't get here yet. So uh, anyway, it's, it's really more than that. We, we have water projects and Zach, I know, helped Navajo with the water project down there. Mm -hmm as well as in the, some tribes in the Northwest. So we're and doing a lot of for and back and, and PTM as well. So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Miigwech and uh, bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say one more thing about the Iroquois Nationals lacrosse team. Okay. We are battling, we are battling to be in the Olympics right oh, that's now. That's right, yeah. Yeah. We are battling right now to be yeah. included in the Olympics when they when they bring lacrosse in in 2028. And all we're right, going to help make sure that happens. We are going to make sure that happens, Oren. Well, we need That's all your support to absolutely. have the airport. Absolutely. We got you. <laughs> and he, he forgot to mention that uh, Onondaga also has their own passports, so they are recognized internationally, and that's how they wow. travel. So it's a, an amazing thing, that's and cool. I look forward to everybody learning more about the Haudenosaunee nations as well as other tribal nations in the country. So thank you again. Be well, be safe, and mask up three ply as much as you can. Take care. Love you. Love you. Love you. Bye. See you guys. Good luck. <laughs>